Okay. Well, my name is Fran Mayer, and welcome to another Napa Institute conversation. Today, our guest is Arthur C. Brooks. Uh, Arthur Brooks is the William Henry Bloomberg Professor of the Practice of Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School and Professor of Management Practice at Harvard Business School. Before joining the Harvard faculty in July of 2019, he served for 10 years as president of the American Enterprise Institute, the public policy think tank based in Washington, D.C. Brooks is the author of nearly a dozen books, including the national bestsellers, Love Your Enemies, The Conservative Heart, and The Road to Freedom. He's a columnist for The Atlantic Magazine, host of the podcast, The Art of Happiness with Arthur Brooks, and author most recently of From Strength to Strength, Finding Success, Happiness, and Deep Purpose in the Second Half of Life, published by Penguin and released on February 15th. Arthur, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Fran. Wonderful to be with you. Now, I have to, before we get into the substance of your book, Arthur, I've got to ask you, uh, one of the marks of your work consistently and everything that I've read that you've done is a kind of um, balance and a refusal to get into the traumas of anger and fear. And I'm wondering how in the world you managed to do that. You've been a public intellectual for most of your career in a very conflicted time. Yeah, it's a, let's just say I paid my debt to society. I was the president of a think tank in Washington, D.C. And, and I saw the, over a long period of time, I saw what happens when one succumbs to that. It's interesting, you know, there's a, the biblical teaching that perfect love drives out fear, the psychological truth that that, that, that shows. And, and by the way, that's an ancient teaching that even predates anything that we'd see from the Apostle John. Uh, Lao Tzu said the same thing 500 years earlier. And, and what it suggests and what, what the psychological research subsequently has shown is that love and fear are opposites. Mm -hmm. and, and so therefore, we as, as Catholics, we're committed to a life of love. I mean, God is love. And when, and interestingly, when the Pharisee asks the master, you know, the Ten Commandments, it's a lot to remember. Boil it down to something simpler. He says, love the Lord your God with all your soul and all your strength and all your heart and all your might. And love your neighbor as yourself while you're at it, because this is the expression of how we can love God. And then when St. Augustine was asked 300 years later to make it even simpler, he said, love and do what you will. So if we're going to live a life of love, we are militating against fear. And fear is the vehicular language of what's actually happening in the vortex of politics and, and ideological conflict. The culture war is driven by fear. If I'm going to be living my, my, my Catholic apostolate, the language has to be love. And it's just simply... It's simply not consistent with, with the language of what's going on politically in the United States and around the world. You make the point, uh, an important point there, that love um, and fear are really the opposites, not love and hate, right. which is what people typically assume. Right. No, yeah. And hate is downstream from fear, of course. Hate is a, a byproduct of fear. Mm -hmm. We find this all the time. When people hate, it's because they're motivated by fear of something. Inevitably, that's the case. It, it, it can be just kind of a, a virtue signal to, a, to you know, the, the, the peanut gallery on one political side. But, but if it's true hate, then it is fear-driven. And, and the only analgesic for that is love. And one of the things that I think a lot of people don't know is that you have a, a whole musical side to you and a background. I mean, where does that fit into this balance and hope that you manage to maintain? <laughs> I started off my career as a, as a classical French horn player. And uh, before I went to college, I didn't, I didn't finish college till I was about 30. And all the way through my, my 20s, I was, I was touring as a classical horn player. Um, my, my parents called it my gap decade. <laughs> and, it, it was, and, and during that time, I have to say, I mean, I was basically my vocation was beauty was the greatest that had been ever written, the greatest sounds that it had, ever, had ever been heard, at least in the Western tradition. And, and I, oh, by the way, I also studied a lot of Eastern music. I studied tabla, North Indian classical drumming, and, and, and some Indonesian music along the way. So it wasn't exclusively what we learned in the West. But in the West, this was my, this was my tradition. And immersed in this beauty, I think I finally, I, I figured out along the way the meaning of it, um, not in listening to the work of the greatest composer who ever lived, in my view, which is Johann Sebastian Bach, also known as the fifth apostle, because mm -hmm. of his deep commitment to the, to the Savior. I mean, ultimately, this is what he cared about. He was asked by a biographer near the end of his life, why do you write music? And he didn't say, because I'm good at it, or because 
I mean, he had 20 children that he had 20 mouths to feed. That's not why he raised that. The aim and final end of all music is nothing less than the glorification of God and the refreshment of the soul. That's the point of beauty. That's the meaning and purpose of beauty. And, and I've carried that through for the rest of my life. I went on and I, you know, I did my PhD and became a social scientist and an academic. I ran a company and all that. But all along the way, this is the essence of apostolate. You know, what's the point? And the point is the glorification of God and the refreshment of the soul. And so as I've gone from music to ideas to even work in public policy and now back to what I'm doing right now full time, which is work on the science of happiness, it has to be apostolic insofar as that there's only one reason for doing it, which is to love the Lord my God with all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself, which is, or to paraphrase in the beautiful words of Bach, to glorify God and to refresh the soul. So, Arthur, you're still a young man. You're in your 50s. I mean, why did you write, <laughs> why did you write a book about the second curve? I mean, the, 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 this particular book at this particular time, what motivated you to write it? The, the, what I found was that most people actually find that their skills start to wane much earlier than they think. Um, there's been a long uh, line of research on, on the types of geniuses. And generally speaking, it shows that there are two types of great genius and accomplishment. One happens early. And it's this innovation genius, kind of an, a, a Mark Zuckerberg kind of genius. And that tends to peak in one's late 30s and declines dramatically through one's 40s. And virtually every profession, whether it's law or medicine or financial planning or even air traffic controllers and, and machinists, they find that their ability to, to solve problems innovatively declines tremendously. And so the reason I wrote this is because Number one, people tend to decline in a way that is alarming and disappointing sooner than they think. But number two, the good news is there's a second curve that actually tends to start in your 40s and increase in your 50s. You have this success curve, this second type of genius, which is the teacher genius, the Dalai Lama genius, the great sage genius, with the ability to take great ideas and to assemble them and share them more coherently than you ever could before. And so the reason I wrote this is because I'm on my second curve. And I did this research for myself. I noticed that when I was in my early 30s, I was writing academic journal articles that are mathematically too complex for me to understand now. I literally can't understand my own math from 25 years ago. But now I'm a better teacher than I've ever been because the first curve is your, 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 your innovation curve, your, your inventor, your entrepreneur curve. Your second is your great sage, your master teacher curve. And, and what we need to do, whether we change jobs or not, some people can change jobs, some people can't, but everybody can retool their career and their life to get onto their second curve if A, they're willing to do the work, and B, they understand that that second curve exists. Mm -hmm. And by the way, one more point about that, when does the second half of your adult life start? Most people think it's, you know, 40. Mm -mm. Your adult life, if you make it to 20 and you're in good health, you can expect these days to live to 90. Mm -hmm. And that means your adult life is 70 years long and you're halfway done at 55. Mm -hmm. 55, I'm halfway through my adult life. I, I better have a plan for that second half or it's going to be pretty boring. Um, you got to tell, tell our audience uh, that that opening anecdote that you have in your book. I read that first first paragraph and I was completely hooked for the rest of the book. So please share it because it's just absolutely fabulous. Well, you know, I was I, I started on the on the trail of this book on this research project, not because I was trying to write a book. I was actually, it's not research, it's me search, quite frankly. Because mm -hmm. um, I had this experience. I was I was feeling a little bit unsure of what the rest of my life was going to look like. I was noticing that I was a little less interested, a little less passionate about the things that I had gotten really good at in the first part of my career. And I had an experience of hearing, overhearing a conversation of a couple behind me on an airplane late at night. And the husband was, I assumed it was the husband. They were having an intimate conversation. I could tell they were elderly by the sound of their voices. And I knew it was a man and a woman. So I just made some inferences. And, and the husband was confessing to his wife that he, he, he might as well be dead, that Nobody loved him or appreciated him anymore. And his wife was consoling him for 20 minutes. And I figured it was somebody who was really disappointed because they never really achieved much, never really lived up to his own expectations or the expectations of his family or whatever. And the lights went on at the end of the flight and everybody stood up and I turned around. And it was one of the most famous men in the world. 
somebody who will do 10 times as much as my with my with his life as I've ever done with mine. And yet he was living proof that it is no insurance policy in this mortal coil to do a lot and bank it. On the contrary, that's not how satisfaction works at all. And in subsequent research, I found that in, in fact, it's the strivers who struggle the most later in life. Because look, Fran, if you never do anything, you won't notice when it's over, quite <laughs> frankly. <laughs> And, but people who go, real, I mean, they, they work. And I'm not talking about people who are rich and famous. I'm talking about people who just simply try to do a lot with what they've been given. When they come down off their first success curve, it can be very bitter. And if they chase that for the rest of their lives, they're in, 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 there's got a lot of frustration in store. And that's what the man on the plane, he had had great success early in life. He was dining out on it and was still very rich because of it. But his great accomplishments were long past and he had missed his second curve because he was trying to stay on the first curve. And yeah. I said, wow, I don't want that. So I did a, you know, a research that was in notebooks for myself. Because look, I'm a, I'm a behavioral social scientist. I'm a specialist in the science of happiness. And I made it out. I made a life plan for myself and my wife, Esther. She looked at that and she said, it's not a good Catholic thing for you to keep that to yourself. So I published it as a book. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, Arthur, one of the things that I've noticed over my lifetime, and, and we're looking back over the last 70 years, I mean, the, the, there's been a, a huge culture shift in this country with a, a simultaneous, a kind of an ironic simultaneous focus on uh, the new and the young while population continues to age and the birth rate drops. And I'm just wondering, why is that happening and what, what does it portend for the culture long-term? Yeah, well, there's always been an obsession with youth, uh, with youth and beauty and vigor, et cetera. And part of the reason is because we have, uh, we worship the altar of the first success curve, which is known as the fluid intelligence curve. And the reason for that is because throughout history, that's the only curve people got because people died. I mean, you got one curve, how are you gonna know? I mean, the, the odd person, the Methuselah, the Noah, the, the Abraham who would who would you know go on to be the great sage and the passer on of traditions. These were the, the exception to the rule. There really was only one curve out there. So the result is our culture is based on this idea that you, you hit it hard, you you ramp up, you do great things. And what we've not been able to do, what we've never been able to conceive of before is this idea that there's a second kind of crystallized intelligence that that can really save us in many ways that we actually need. And so what I'm working toward right now, and it's really capturing my imagination, quite frankly, is this idea that, that, that we need more people on their second curve to develop that second curve and to help us all. You know, it, one of the reasons that we have not quite apprehended that, that, that knowledge has exploded, it's for good and for ill, quite frankly, but the reason that knowledge has exploded is precisely because people are living longer and able to pass on ideas in a way that other people can learn. If you go back to, you know, why is it that we didn't have cars and technology and telephones and electricity in the year 300? It was partly because people didn't live long enough to pass on ideas. And so we had to invent things again and again and again. But now, I mean, look at you, you're in perfect health and you're way past the age when people would have been dead a few hundred years ago. You would have been like, you, would have, you were Methuselah a few hundred years ago, and now you're in your prime. You got 20 years left, man. I mean, that's incredible, but we don't know how to harness that yet. So one of the things that I'm thinking about right now, because I'm quite involved with a lot of organizations in Silicon Valley and the tech economy, they're all screwed up. You know, the tech economy out, you know, near Napa, our, you know, beloved Napa is, you know, that they've gone from the most admired part of the entrepreneurial uh, capitalist economy to the least admired in 15 years. How do you squander that? And the answer is it's run by kids. It's mm -hmm. run by people who do things that are selfish and dangerous and hurt and harmful. And they don't even know it. And everybody over 70 just shakes their head and go, you're making every mistake in the book. What's wrong with you? Yeah. So my objective now is to actually get real diversity in boardrooms, real diversity in C-suites. My, my view is that there's no company of any material size that should not have at least one person older than 70 in the C-suite mm -hmm. who's been through the school of hard knocks and has crystallized intelligence and can basically school everybody into not making stupid mistakes. And so that's actually one of my big initiatives is more old people in, a, in, a, in an aftermarket for labor. 
Dear God, that's rad that's radically cult countercultural right now, Arthur. I mean, it's I I, I don't know. You're gonna be working, Fran, until you're in your late eighties. <laughs> I have anything to say about it. <laughs> I want to go back to the idea for uh, of success for a moment because you have an image that just struck me so powerfully in there about how um, I mean, success is obviously a good thing. I mean, everybody wants to succeed, and it's part of our God given. A vocation to be fruitful, but it can very easily become an addiction. And part mm -hmm. of that addiction is simultaneously this weird um, paradox of needing to have more or be more successful than the next guy, no matter how successful you are. And at the si same time, being chased by the fear of failure or being found out to not being, uh, not being adequate. I mean, how do you get off that treadmill? Because that becomes highly addictive. And, and, and a lot of people, and I know a lot of them, uh, do wonderful work, motivated primarily by fear. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing to understand is that what all addictions have in common is a, is a neuromodulator in the brain called dopamine. And most people are pretty familiar with it at this point. It was cutting edge research 20 years ago. Now, now there are popular books on dopamine. But what all, you know, people who are alcoholic, people who are addicted to cigarettes, people who compulsively gamble or look at really dangerous, terrible things like pornography, what they have in common is that they're not proud of it, they're ashamed of it, but the, but the dopamine in their brain says, do it again, do it again, do it again. Why? Because dopamine programs you to get little hits of satisfaction and your life will seem empty unless you're hitting the satisfaction button over and over and over again. It leads to compulsive behavior to fill a void. That's what all of these addictions have in common. Now, most people um, are, are, as I said, ashamed of those particular activities. But weirdly in our culture, one of the most addictive things that we do that we're proud of is trying to be successful in worldly ways. Now, Aquinas was, 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 was he didn't have the, 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 the technological or, or scientific sophistication that we just, the information that we have right now. He didn't know what dopamine was. Nobody had the slightest idea at that time. time. But in the Summa, Aquinas talks about the worldly idols. And the worldly idols are the things with, and, and Bishop Barron is really great on this. He's, I mean, Bishop Barron is really great on everything, quite frankly, um, and, and a mentor of mine. And, and Bishop Barron talks about how, how Aquinas describes the divine characteristics of four things, money, power, pleasure, and honor. And honor is not in the modern sense. I mean, my son, the Marine, serves with honor, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about fame and prestige and the admiration of the world. Money, power, pleasure, and honor. These are the idols that look sort of godlike because they draw you in inexorably that the world admires and the world tells you you should go for. But they're the dopamine hit just as strong as any pornography or, or methamphetamine. And so what happens is you hit that. Now, who is actually prone to this? This is a really interesting thing about addiction. You know, in the studies of addiction, we find that, that people tend to become addicted to something where they have a little lack already. And so if you're in a bunch of teenage kids, you're all your 13 and 14 year old buddies and somebody sneaks a carton of cigarettes away from your uncle who smokes and you're all trying out the cigarettes for the first time. The one kid who's like, I like it is the one who has a little bit of attention deficit because it's drawing. What nicotine does is it draws dopamine to the prefrontal cortex and it gives you focus maybe for the first time in your life. And you say, I want that. I need that. People self-medicate with the things to which they become addicted. That's the same thing with alcohol. Most alcoholics or the people with the greatest tendency toward alcoholism are above average education, above average income men, strivers, guys like us. Those are the people who have to watch the alcohol because those, those are the people who are stressed out and, and they cut their anxiety, turn it off like a switch with alcohol. Okay, now let's get to success. Who are the people who are most likely to become addicted to hitting the dopamine lever, sort of the monkey on cocaine again and again and again? It, 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 it. They're the people who self-objectify because they're trying to live up to somebody's standards. They're the people who heard from the time that they were a kid, you're the special one, you're the smart one, you're the hard worker, you're going to do great things, which is a wonderful thing in moderation to tell your children. But they internalize that and they see themselves as excellent success machines and they can't stop because after a while, the only satisfaction you can get is from this temporal, ungodly, idolatrous notion that ultimately is the world's accolades that are going to give you the thing that you ultimately seek. You know in your heart it's wrong, but the dopamine in your brain and, and tyrannical mother nature tell you otherwise. You have a chapter uh, on death 
which is a subject that most people want to avoid at all costs, but you really write about it very beautifully. And the, you mentioned the importance of pondering death. You use a lot of um, Buddhist references, but of course, there's a long tradition, Mento Mori in, in Christianity, which is part right. of your background as well. Why did you write that chapter and how do you connect it to the subsequent chapter on cultivating your Aspen, your own personal Aspen Grove? I thought that was a beautiful image. Thank you. The, the, the reason I talk about death is not necessarily because everybody who's listening and watching us right now is literally afraid of death. Only 20% of the population has a pathological fear of death. It's a phobia called thanatophobia. One in five is a lot, but most aren't. And my guess is, I mean, look, everybody watching us are, are, are serious about their Catholic faith or they aspire to be serious about their Catholic faith. And, and most Catholics are not that afraid of death because we know where we're going. If we, you know, we, we hope we know where we're going. And, and so, but that's not my point. My point is that we all have fear. And the fears that we have, generally speaking, are a version of the fear of death. Even if we're not afraid of death, if we're a fear of being forgotten, if we're fear of being irrelevant, if we're fear of decline in our abilities, those are all fears of death. Those are all fears of what it means to be alive. Many people will say, my work is my life. Well, if you become incompetent in your work, you, you're dead. You're walking dead. I, I'm afraid of, you know, people won't remember me. You're afraid of being dead and what death means to you. So we go back to the ancient Catholic tradition, but also the ancient Hindu and Buddhist tradition, every tradition, which has worked seriously to understand the nature of the heart and mind, and, and say, how do you get beyond any fear? Well, psychoanalysts will tell you that if you're afraid of snakes, you need to start looking at pictures of snakes and becoming exposed to snakes. Why? Because you want to make snakes ordinary. When it's not, when it's not extraordinary, it's not scary. That's just a, a truth of human behavior. And we need to expose ourselves to the object of our fears. So I, I, I introduce what is called the Maranasati Theravada Buddhist meditation. But, but again, one of the reasons I talk an awful lot about Buddhism is because I want to find different entryways for people who are in different places, right. which is a really important thing for a secular audience to be mm -hmm. sure. You can't read the book for you know more than five pages without noting that I'm, I'm Catholic because I keep mentioning it over and over. Yeah, I got it. Brooks is Catholic. I get it. But but I talk about you know His Holiness the Dalai Lama with whom I have a long uh, relationship and and I give people different you know, on ramps onto the freeway of this of these ideas. And this Buddhist meditation is is a, a deep dive, contemplative dive into the essence of your own death. And then I say, okay, write the one for the thing that you're afraid of. What I ask my students at Harvard to do, they're all horribly afraid of failure because they're, they don't have any experience with failure. These are super high achievers, super hard workers, incredibly bright, dedicated. You know, they say, ah, Harvard's overrated. It's not, it's, it's literally the greatest university in the world. I mean, and it, it's well-deserved. It's not perfect, <laughs> obviously, but and so, but they're afraid of failure because all the work they did to get to Harvard means that they've never experienced very much of it. So I make them, I literally make my MBA students write a version of the Buddhist death meditation, contemplating their own professional failure. Mm -hmm. I'm not living up to my potential. I think my parents feel sorry for me. I see my friends going past me on the career track. I'm still living at home. I make them contemplate these ideas to, to revel in the fear and, and they come out, they're free. They're actually free. It's the most amazing thing. And, and, and we all can do that to save ourselves from the fear. And then of course the, the Catholic twist is now, now, now bathe yourself in the blood of Christ, you know, surround yourself with the love of the master. And then what used to have that hole that used to be occupied by fear filled up with love and, and there's the magic. Talk a little bit about the Aspen Grove. Hmm. The Aspen Grove is, an, is, is, a, is a metaphor that I use when I'm talking to strivers. They often, they often think of the tree as the lone and solitary tree that it, it might be isolated, it might be lonely, but it's always strong. And, you know, we think back to the first psalm that, you know, the righteous man is planted by streams of water and, and strong in all that he does, et cetera, but isolated. Mm -hmm. The aspen tree, it's an interesting thing. I was actually thinking about this metaphor when I was in Aspen, Colorado, sitting under an aspen tree, thinking about this book. And a friend of mine who knows a lot more about botany than I do says, it's actually the best possible metaphor for the nature of how we exist, a fellow Catholic, by the way. He said, why? Because it looks like a solitary 
organism, and it's not. That's right. It's actually all of the aspens in an entire aspen grove are one tree. <laughs> it's one root system, and each tree is simply shoots that come out of that particular tree. Mm -hmm. Now, this is important. The world's largest living organism in the whole world is an aspen grove in Utah called Pando. It's 106 acres of aspen trees, 6 million kilograms of, of wood. That's one plant. And so if you see yourself as a solitary creature, you're misunderstanding the nature of yourself. Now, the Buddhists, they have this whole thing called, you know, that the, is illusion, this concept, this, this concept that, that your, your individuality is an illusion. We, we don't think that as Christians, but we do understand that we are cosmically connected. That in point of fact, that, that Fran and Arthur, we're, we, we are, we're both, we're sons of the Lord. And, and, in, and, and that's, a, that's a, a cosmic tie that we, we can't break. The fact that I'm alone is just is simply a misunderstanding of what it means to be alive on earth. And so if you're going to think about your life as, you know, I'm going to cultivate my, my own tree. And uh-oh, my tree's not healthy. Uh-oh, my tree's starting to get old. I mean, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. You want to see you, your true plant? Look at the next aspen, aspen tree over, which is your son, your daughter, your grandchild, your friend, your enemy. That's you too, is the bottom line. And, and so when, when the Lord said, Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that's just simply taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, that's just good botany is what it comes down to. But you know, you uh, it's interesting because that when I first heard that Aspen Grove image, we lived in Colorado for many years, and it was a complete revelation to me that you're really talking, well, you capture it so well in the book that we're all interrelated like like the, the Aspens are. But nonetheless, Arthur, I just want to hang on that idea of loneliness for a moment, because certainly you've mentioned your wife, Esther, you've mentioned your son in the Marines. I have four children. My wife and I have been married for 52 years. And so I'm oh, not right. lonely. Okay. Yeah. But a lot of people are, a yeah. lot of people are, it seems to be pandemic in the cult. That's the real pandemic in the culture. Um, do you have anything more to say about that? You've already been very articulate in terms of the inter interactions, interconnections of people using the Aspen Grove image. But um, is there something in the water in the United States that does that to us? Makes yeah, us I mean, a lot of times that we hear um, that there's something about our, either about our culture or about our economy that's driving us into incredible isolation, turning us into kind of isolated homo economicus that just work, 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 work not have any meaningful relationships, substituting worldly success. And I hear this a lot from my Catholic brothers and sisters who say, this is the problem with capitalism, for example. But that's all nonsense. You know, the truth of the matter is that, you know, capitalism, what a blessing. It's pulled 2 billion people out of poverty since you and I were kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, what do we believe as Catholics? Wipe out poverty, man. Share prosperity. Lift other people up. You know, bring as much of the goodness of the kingdom as we possibly can to earth while we're walking the earth. I mean, what a wonderful thing it is. The trouble is, it's just a machine. Like any other economic system, it's a machine. What we need to be in right relation with God and right relation with each other, and we're not. Mm -hmm. The two big mistakes that we're making and that are getting worse, and when you said it's pandemic, no joke, I had a, on my own show, I had Vivek Murthy, who's our wonderful Surgeon General for President Biden. And I asked him, what's the biggest public health crisis in America? He did not say COVID-19 or opiates or gun violence that everybody says. He said it's loneliness. It's isolation. And there's two big things that are happening. We find that people are, are not falling in love. That's the first big problem that I yes. find. And we find that people in their, in their 20s and 30s today are 35% are less likely to be married than you and I were in our 20s. They're, by the way, also less likely to be cohabitating. Yeah. So even the things that we don't approve of, but at least, at least they're a product <laughs> of love. Yeah. They're, they're a third less likely to be in love than we were. Now, there's a lot having to do with that, but always, always remember, perfect love drives out fear. And so if you see fear, there's not perfect love. The reason that we actually see so much isolation, so much loneliness, so such a lack of love itself is because there is so much fear of repudiation, so much fear of rejection. So that's number one, is a lack of romantic love. So when I'm on college campuses, I say, you guys need to be in love. You guys need to go fall in love. Go fall in love. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, what? How? My students are asking, how do I do this? I wind up, I teach happiness at Harvard. You know, it's like the people ask, you know, you teach at the Harvard Business School. What's it? Accounting or supply chain management? It's like, no, happiness. And I have the central module that I teach in the, in the happiness class at Harvard is about 
romantic love and they're just locked on. You know, they're super good at, at doing business startups and doing VC and getting investors and understanding, you know, the, the balance sheets and, but they have the slightest idea how to confess their love for somebody. So I talk about entrepreneurial principles, taking risk in love. You know, it's, it's interesting. I say, you know, you're a startup, you're a startup, your life is a startup and the, and the, the currency of your startup is love. And that means you need to take a lot of risk in, in exchange for explosive rewards. And you need to have faith in resources that are not currently in hand. This is all gospel. This is all just Catholicism. Anyway, so that's number one is romantic love. The second is friendship. Mm -hmm. And friendship is really interesting because friendship is actually the punchline of romantic love. If you look at, at your marriage or mine, why do they work? Ah, just cosmic soulmates. Nonsense. It's because we had the ignition of passion. And then it was backfilled with friendship. Absolutely. That essence of it, right? I mean, that's it's absolutely it. absolutely true. It's absolutely it's, true. It's companionate love. It sounds so dull, but there's nothing better than companionate love, which also has plenty of passion. But the point is, it's Christian friendship is what I have with Esther and you have with your wife. That is actually how it works. And, and this is the second big crisis, is the crisis of friendship. Fewer people have close friends. I mean, I think about my, one of my closest friends that I just love so much is Frank Hanna, our mutual friend, Frank Hanna. Yeah. Atlanta, I love him. I talk to him a couple of times a week. We do business sometimes, but it's just a pretext to hang out. And I, call, I talk to him a couple of times a week. I know what's going on with, you know, with Sally. He knows what's going on with Esther. I know his kids. It's a beautiful thing. You know what it is? It's not a deal friendship. It's a real friendship. Mm -hmm. Christian friendship is a real friendship. It's communion about affairs of the heart. And, and that's the second thing we've gotten really bad at. I have two more questions, Arthur. Thank you for all the time you've given me. Uh, the, the, you have an entire chapter on making weakness your strength. Uh, what do you mean by that phrase? And then, I mean, actually, how do you do it? <laughs> yeah. So weakness is a funny thing. Because what we learn in modern life, or what we learn in sort of any life, for that matter, is that is that 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 we should we should hide our weaknesses. And the one thing we should never do is to fill people in on the things that we're bad at, because it's just horrible marketing. You know, at HBS where I teach, you know, so it's, you don't go around and say, you know, let me tell you about the the weak points of my organization. But there's an interesting point about that. When I think about who's the greatest entrepreneur who ever lived, Henry Ford, Steve Jobs. I don't know. Let's just see how many iPhones are going to be out there in the year 4,000, 2,000 years from now. Mm -hmm. The greatest mm -hmm. entrepreneur who ever lived, in my view, is St. Paul. Mm -hmm. St. Paul, man, that guy knew how to market a product. He knew how to plant the seed that was going to endure across the generations. Now, probably when he died, he probably thought that he was, it wasn't going so well. I mean, the, the letter to the Corinthians that we read over and over, everybody reads the second letter to Corinthians about love at their, at their wedding, you know. There probably were like 20 Corinthians that were reading that letter. And, and, and they were, you know, kind of off the reservation a little bit. They were, I don't know. I mean, they were pretty sketchy. Cor Corinth was a pretty sketchy, dodgy place. But, and, but what was his marketing strategy when he was actually traveling all around the ancient world? And the answer was he was talking about the thorn in his flesh. He was talking about the fact, he said that in my weakness, I'm made strong. What a weird thing to say. What that was, was he was, his marketing was to bond himself to other people. And here's the thing that we miss today. You can't actually make common cause with others. You can't get other people's hearts. You can't relate to others in your strength. You can't say, it's like, you know, you, I'll tell you what, you know how you can relate to me? I'm a professor at Harvard. Everybody can relate to that. That's not relatable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm glad. I mean, I, I would say I'm proud of it, but that's a deadly sin. I'm pleased about it, but it's not relatable. You know what's relatable is all the trouble in my life, all the suffering that I've endured, all the things I worry about with my, with my young adult children, all of the mistakes that I've made, all the heartache that I have. You know, it's a, you know, what, what, how can people relate to you? My wife yelled at me this morning. Well, guess what? You know, that's relatable, <laughs> you know? And, and, and that's a really important thing for us to keep in mind because as, as Catholics, this is not an, an exercise in ego. We got one chance we're walking the earth. What are we trying to do? I mean, Tom Monahan, you know, the founder of so many important things, not just Domino's Pizza and the Detroit Tigers. I mean, he is, you know, Avi Maria, he always says, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get to heaven and take as many people with me as I can. Yeah. People are not going to follow you into heaven because they can't relate to you. 
They're going to follow you into heaven because you're, you're a living example of virtue and you're just like them. <laughs> so the Catholic advertisement is you're like me and I'm happy. So do what I'm doing. And you're not going to be just like them. And if you're talking about the ways in which you're superhuman, extraordinary, and you're not going to get it by hiding the, the ways that you're actually human, your human frailty makes you, it's a, it, you know, the, the worst, most off-putting thing for people in, in, in leadership is to be defensive. The hardest thing to do, but the most winsome thing is to be defenseless. And you that's entered, weakness. Arthur, last question. You entered the Catholic Church in the in 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 your teens, um, and it obviously had an impact on on your whole career, your life, the choices right. that you made, and the way that you've thought about this book. You end the book with seven words to remember. What are those seven words, and why those seven words? The world has a formula for us. You know, the world has, and, and of course, it's a false formula. It's the world. You know. The world's formula for happiness, the false formula for happiness is love things, use people, and worship yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what you get from the entertainment industry, that's what you get from media, that's what you get from everything, right? That's how to be successful. That puts you on the, on the hedonic treadmill, hitting the success lever yeah. over and over and over again. It turns out that the reason it's convincing is because it's so close to the right formula. See, this is how the devil works, right? The devil doesn't actually come up with something wholly new that's foreign. He takes something good and rotates the matrix just a little bit, right? And this is exactly an example of this. Because the truth is that the right formula, the godly formula, the biblical formula, the Catholic formula, is to use things in abundance, enjoy, love people. Because people are made for love and worship the Lord. That's it. It's seven words. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it's weirdly simple. Now, there's a lot of other stuff you can you can you can you can hang off of it. I also recommend going to mass every day, saying your rosary, and reading a lot of scripture. Why? Because it makes it easier to use only things, to love only people, and to worship only the Lord. The how part of that is a little bit complicated and requires some effort and work and prayer. But the what, based on the why, it's not that hard. Arthur, thank you so much. And I, I have to tell the people who see and hear this that they have to go out and buy this book. From Strength to Strength is just an absolutely terrific read. It's very, I um, mean, it's very life-giving, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful way to spend your time reading and, and thinking about these things. You've been terrific. Very grateful, really. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for your time. It's wonderful to be with you.